So this is a cartoon image of a cell. What it shows is there's two types of DNA within it. Uh, the next step after discovering DNA is working out what we can do with it. What biochemical engineers did was you create a recombinant DNA. So what we have on the, this side is the bacterial DNA, and then over here is the plasmids. The plasmids are what we call recombinant DNA, and recombinant DNA is really just um, DNA that is taken from somewhere else, formed into a circle, and then stuck into a bacteria. So what it can do, though, is if you pick the right bits of DNA, so for instance, the initial one, which I'm going to come on to next, um, was for insulin. If you find the genes that produce insulin within the body, you can cut out that, that genetic information, circular, uh, form it into a circle, stick it into a bacteria, the bacteria will then make your insulin. So the first one, as I've just said, is 1978, a great year, a year of my birth. Um, they discovered how to make recombinant human insulin. It's a massive step forward because before that, for all diabetics, we had to harvest insulin from animals. So we'd harvest them from cattle, pigs, cows, um, and they were effective, but not, and the insulin from animals is very effective, but it's not as effective as human insulin. So the ability to create human insulin within a, bacterial, within a bacteria was the first step. Uh, it was first made in E. coli. Now other bacteria, uh, yeast can make it. So Picchia pastoris is used to make it now industrially, as is uh, baker's yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, another example of a recombinant protein is the, recomb uh, the protein chymosin. That is a protein that's found in hardening cheese. And 90% of all American cheese production is done using this, which is been produced ever since the 90s in E. coli also. Um, so we're getting kind of closer and closer to the present day. What we have to think about is the millennial marvelous microbe. So far, we've been talking a lot about bacteria, fungi, yeast, and molds, because that's what we used up until maybe 30 years ago. From then on, what we've started to do is use different cells, because we have the ability to use different cells. So an algae is a traditional, a microalgae is a traditional microbe. What isn't a traditional microbe is a mammalian cell. Uh, the mammalian cells usually don't, weren't initially thought to be useful as single cell organisms. But with this list, what we can see is, as you go down the list, more or less, the cells get larger and more complex. With a larger and more complex cell, you can make a larger and more complex product. Sometimes, especially with healthcare, you need a very large and very complex product. So we, we as a community, the, decided that it would be useful to be able to use mammalian cells or cells that are derived from mammals as the starting block for a biological process. Right, before we get on to kind of the present and future, which is the main bulk of the talk, we need to think about one element, which is a tool which is kind of now ubiquitous within our, my field of engineering, and that is synthetic biology. I'm going to go through it quickly uh, for two reasons. I don't really understand it, but um, I, I do really. Uh, it's <laughs> but I'm a tra traditionally an engineer, so it, was a long, it took me a little while to get to grips with this. So for a long time, I felt like this. Just witchcraft. <laughs> Wizardry is a little bit of a magic box, and I didn't really know what was going on in it. I also thought to explain it, because to explain it, you actually need um, to contextualize it. And we're going to go back first to the recombinant DNA, which I've just described, um, and say if recombinant DNA is a bit like flat pack furniture, in that you have the bits there. You make, the, you make the chair, then synthetic biology takes it a step further. What it would do, instead of just having the bits already made so you can make a chair, is it would 
let you make a chair from a tree. So the tree could be your starting block. The cell would then create the tools to break that tree down uh, and create the pieces that you can put together to make a chair. That is a simple uh, kind of explanation of how the level has increased for our genetic knowledge when you go from recombinant DNA to synth synthetic biology. But with more knowledge about synthetic biology, so we're talking about some of the stuff that you may have heard of in scientific news, like CRISPR-Cas9, you can go even one step further. So instead of having a tree, which obviously is made of wood and wouldn't be too hard to make the tools to make the flat pack furniture, you could do this instead. You could use a chair, break it down, make new pieces, make a different chair. You could take a table, break it down, new pieces, make a chair. We're still looking at wood stuff, so it can go even further, hence the picture of the plastic bag. You could literally, as long as it has the right molecules in it and you had the right suite of enzymes, break down anything and make almost anything else. That is the beauty of synthetic biology.